My wife and I were watching a movie. We were not watching the election results because I honestly did not think that I was going to get elected. All of a sudden got a phone call from the party secretary. The exact words that came out of his mouth was, looks like we've won a seat, looks like it's you. Uh, yeah, I certainly didn't expect to see myself landing a, a seat in the federal Senate, but the way the rules were at the time, which I had been for 32 years, it, it allowed me to have that opportunity. It allowed voters to have that opportunity to vote for somewhere outside the major party and have their vote count until the very last person was elected. I am Senator Ricky Muir. I'm a senator for the state of Victoria and I reside in Gippsland. I was a blue collar worker uh, and that was my background. Just an ordinary run of the mill country boy. The very next morning we woke up and there's just a line of media at the front uh, of our house. I had to figure out then what do I do? I'm about to go outside and front the media with national interest and uh, the national spotlight on me. What I'm going to say, how am I going to deal with this? I've never had media training. You know, big breath, let's get out and do this. So there's a political noise which I had to start to learn how to deal with and trying to learn how to deal with the media. It didn't take long for the media to find a little bit of um, tomfoolery on YouTube, chop it down to suit their own agenda and put it out there. And I realised very quick that this is going to be intense. And um, you know, ever since, it's just roll with the punches and figure out what works, what doesn't, and just keep moving forward. So there was that nine month period from when I was elected to when I took the actual Senate seat. Uh, that was a really bizarre time for me. Um, you know, I had people pushing and pulling and you know, there was public squabbling. There was, it was a really intense moment of my life. Uh, so I spent a lot of time outside of uh, trying to manage family time and uh, that trip to Boston which made me infamous, um, uh, which is where the Willisie interview came from. Do you understand what the balance of power means? Yes, it's the potential if... Uh, sorry, can we go to another question? <laughs> I've just got myself in a fluster. While all that was going on, I just had to try to understand the rules, what I was getting myself into. And then once I got in, I realised that it doesn't matter how much you understand it, the major parties have figured out how to play games to such an extent that you're heavily reliant on the Senate staff to um, uh, figure out what's going on and why it's going on because nothing's as it's written in the books. You know, I, ha I had no faith in our political system, to be quite honest. I, I really honestly felt like Parliament was just a tool of an elite few. Unfortunately, I thought what most people did and I thought this is a system that's designed to keep us out. The electoral reform process had a committee period of four hours. That would usually take months in any other process. The biggest changes to our electoral system was crammed through. It's been rushed through to uh, stamp out those who vote for minor parties. What was really fascinating about that, usually on a committee process, was give, give everybody a five minute talking slot. They get to the minor parties and independents. There was three of us at any given stage. That five minutes was divided between three people. They did not want us to speak. They absolutely tried to stamp our views and our questioning out of the equation. Something that so many people would wish their representatives to do, which is to vote on their conscience, I can and I do. I have held the government to account. I have a very big record. It only takes a quick Google to realise that I've had influence over a lot of the decisions that have been passed in Parliament. I'll probably use um, the re renewable energy target as an example here. When that was being debated, it was very likely that it was just going to get rejected. The government was going to give up. Uh, the target was going to fade away. There was going to be no target. And uh, I could see that a flaw needed to be put into place. At least a figure that the coalition government would agree with needed to be put in place so that way it can always be built up from there. But there's no point not debating it because it doesn't suit your ideology and just giving up because it would have resulted in no renewable energy target. The most prominent thing I have actually been telling people and that is make your vote count. Don't just go one. You're being misled if you're of the opinion you need to go one in the above the line and, and walk out of that polling booth. If you go one and you voted for a minor party that doesn't get a quota, your vote literally stopped there. Make sure you make it count. So of course I want people to go one in the little picture of the bubble head with AMEP written under it, but I want them to continue to number their boxes in their own chosen order well and truly passed that, so their vote counted until the very last person was elected. That's probably the key issue. They're still doing it. They're still using how to vote cards and misinforming people by saying one to six. That's not true. The whole intention is you're supposed to have control of your vote till the last person's elected. So everything above the line in your own chosen order, you don't have to follow a how to vote card, but they're not telling you that. I rise to make a statement on the Migration and Maritime Powers Legislation Amendment resolving the Asylum Legacy Caseload Bill 2014. Coming to a decision on this bill has been, without a doubt, one of the hardest decisions I have had to face. A choice between a bad option and a worse option. A decision that involves human beings, children, mothers, fathers, lives of people who have had to endure unthinkable hardship 
people pushed to the point where they go to any lengths to seek asylum. Uh, it was controversial because it did make things harder for resettlement here in Australia, uh, but it did create a pathway. You know, there are these 33, 33 children um, who are going to be deported to Nauru if this bill goes through. So I was able to seek a guarantee from the Minister uh, that they would not be deported to Nauru and that they would have an opportunity to resettle here in Australia. I'm proud of what I did. I'm incredibly proud of what I did. I met those children. I met some of those children. I met some of their family and you know, their gratitude was it's giving me goosebumps now. Being able to hold the government to account, no matter who they are, is an incredibly important role for, for anybody who's given the opportunity to do so. If that's a legacy, if the legacy is left, that ordinary Australians, everyday Australians can stand up, they can learn the role and they can represent their peers and do it uh, you know, with pride, that's something I'd be incredibly proud of for the rest of my life and I would like to think that I've influenced more than one person just to stand up no matter who they are, where they are, what their background is, what their wealth background is and just to have a go because you never know, you never give it a try.